Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and, and thanks for inviting me to, to kick off uh, the day here. That's uh, very nice for our group. I'm going to talk about um, some research that's in a project based at the University of Stirling. Um, there's a few of us in the project, and Dave Griffiths, who's part of that team, co-author, is also here sit sitting at the back. Close to the microphone. Um, so the, uh, the talk today is about um, studying social change and social inequality in the UK, but from a particular focus, actually. It's um, the theme of social distance, how we've used data about social distance and analysis of patterns in social distance to try and answer some questions on social inequality. So first of all, I'll say a little bit about why we would choose that particular angle. Then I've got two sort of groups of empirical results. One of them is more to do with um, uh, lifestyle patterns, leisure consumption type activities, values and views. And the other is much more conventional socioeconomic inequalities, social distances in terms of socioeconomic inequalities. The context of a lot of this stuff is obviously social inequality as a, as a, as a topic of discussion is quite prominent in the UK and, and elsewhere at the moment, not just obviously in the social sciences, but in day-to-day in, in -day, uh, language and terminology. There's lots of popular books and accounts of social inequality um, that are having quite some impact on what people think about the UK and, and how we understand um, the organization of, of inequality. Now, a lot of the accounts are quite hyperbolic. They're, they're, they're really stressing a major lines of inequality, problematic inequality, and they're often also suggestive of change in inequality as well, the dramatically increasing inequality in recent accounts. We've put a f on, the, on the slide there, I've got a couple of examples of some of the popular books at, uh, at the moment, Owen Jones, for instance, uh, Will Hutton. Um, many of these accounts, they're, they're, they're quite influential. People pick up on them and have a sense of the inequalities that are out there, but they're also the details of them are a little bit vague and perhaps a little bit inconsistent from account to account. Which categories of privileged people are the advantaged ones that actually will be different in, these, in, in different studies? They're, they're not necessarily all that clear on how exactly these things are measured anyway. So some of these, so, which some, some of the accounts, this might be presented more as social commentary. You could, as an academic, you could criticize them for being a, a little bit vague and a little bit imprecise. Um, and these accounts are all about socioeconomic inequalities, but there are other interesting inequalities as well. This is a bit of a joke, but it's, 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 partly, it's partly meant to be a, 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 a little bit serious. Um, what people think, their cultures, their lifestyles, even things like the intellectual or otherwise way in which they approach decisions and understanding of the world, voting decisions and so forth. All of these things are markers of inequality in behavior. Um, that have consequences for people's circumstances. A lot of contemporary sociology showing interest in studying people's lifestyle, cultural consumption, tastes, and so forth, and, and the implications of that for inequality. So we can think about inequalities in these sort of dimensions as well as interesting and worth studying, and also the question of whether these sorts of inequalities are, are, are increasing through time, changing through time as well. So in our project as a whole, the language we're tending to use is about studying different sorts of social groups, where social groups might be defined by socioeconomic contours, but they might also be defined by lifestyle, cultural type contours. And we're interested in what evidence there is about important differences between those social groups, big gaps between them, divides between them, and whether those are changing over time. Um, so there's quite a few uh, challenges in this, in this sort of wider endeavor. There's methodological challenges and uh, issues of uh, understanding uh, and, and interpreting the changes. Obviously, a, ma a major challenge um, is going to be the actual definition of the different groups that we're studying. How do we define the educated or, or the occupationally privileged or something like that? Obviously, these, these are long, old issues in, in social statistics, but they don't go away, and we haven't, we haven't got a, a simple uh, solution in, in, in our case. Um, the main issue with studying categories of people and, 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 and being interested in change over time in categories of people is, of course, the relative meaning of being in those categories. Does that change? Classically with educational advantage. If you have people grouped into categories of education, of course, the relative meaning of educational position uh, may be changing somewhat over time. You can't see the details of that image, but the sorts of approach that we, that we frequently use here is some sort of scaling of categories that can be 
relevant relative to the context. So we've got in the, the image there, um, don't bother with the detail, but the image there is scaling of educational categories potentially being different at different points in time. But defining categories is hard enough, but also we want to try and say something about whether or not we can say things are changing through time. Is Britain pulling apart? Are there, are there, are there, are there trends and, and differences over time? And, and that, of course, is also um, really rather difficult. W at what criteria do we mean by change or, or, or pulling apart? At what point do we have a big difference? Um, one of the things I'll try and talk about is whether we can have more formalized um, evaluations. We can have an a priori line of change and how far away is, 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 is the actual pattern from that and, and does that tell us whether or not in our terminology Britain is pulling apart in this context. But there's also the issue of um, time points as well. I don't know if you guys can, can really see that, that, that graph very clearly because um, it, it's quite small but this is showing, well I've labelled it social mobility but it's actually social immobility um, father-son correlations in the UK. When you've got lots of different time points um, and, and occupational data, we see a fairly stable, maybe declining, probably declining over time, father-son correlation. Um, with one exception, and that's the exception that's the one that's popularly known and, and makes it to the newspapers and, and all the politicians believe, which is if you look at very recent data on income, you see um, a different trend. You see increasing inequality um, uh, in the most recent cohorts. So one of the things we often think about studying trends is we want as long a window of observation as possible uh, to, to be able to say something authoritative about uh, social trends. And then, of course, um, one issue in this endeavor is, is whether it's really the most important thing is to actually focus on um, trends at all? Is it just enough to be thinking about important inequalities between social circumstances? So I'll actually be concluding that there isn't really all that much compelling evidence of dramatic social change in Britain any time recently. That's, my, that's the, the, the main conclu conclusion from our study. But I would say that doesn't mean that we um, don't, it's, it's not relevant to, to be studying social inequalities. And of course, whilst things on the whole are often quite stable. Um, if you think of aspects of life in Britain, there's a number of things about our lives that don't really change much over quite a long period of time. There are certain things, of course, related to social inequality and measurement of social inequality that have changed dramatically. So I've put on the slide things like patterns of working life, leisure patterns, family organization, um, housing patterns. They've hardly changed in 100 years. People live much the same lives now as they did um, throughout the 20th century. Um, but there are certain things, aspects of our lives that have changed dramatically, educational expansion, obviously communication through the internet and so forth. So that you can't say there's no social change, although our analysis suggests um, the impact of social change isn't so great. But this is the interplay of some things changing a lot, some things changing not much. Um, and of course this is also interesting because a lot of this, the other studies of social inequalities, particularly in terms of income and, and wealth, are generally pointing towards increasing inequality in, 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 in recent time. Um, not everything um, is in agreement, but by and large, uh, geographical inequalities and inequalities in terms of social background, um, in terms of income and wealth, may well be on a trajectory of increase. And we're not actually in this, in this analysis, we haven't got too much to say directly um, about that. But then there's other sorts of social groups, inequalities between other sorts of social groups, where it's not by no means clear that inequalities are increasing or decreasing. So ethnic inequalities on some criteria are increasing on others, uh, no change on others uh, decreasing. Um, and behind all this, there are, um, well, there's plenty of social theories. Perhaps I won't say uh, much about them, but social theories are often expressed in terms of change over time. But of course, there's, there's no difficulty finding social theories that expect all forms of change over time, whether it's increasing inequality, decreasing inequality, or, or, or no change at all. And actually, when I was looking through the literature, I, I, I realized that a lot of the accounts um, they correspond surprisingly well with national stereotypes of, of, of different outlooks. So the Americans, very optimistic, tend to have a modernization perspective, declining pr social problems through time. British people tend to, British academics tend to say, well, it's not really clear, there's probably nothing happening. French academics, much more pessimistic, um, big change, everything's going, going wrong. But that's just a reassign. So 
we're interested in studying what we call consequential gaps between different social groups, and we can think about where those groups sit in a social structure of inequality. So we've got different ways of measuring where those groups sit in a social structure of inequality. H how do we, well, measure that and then study if it's changing over time? Um, one challenge, and it's not necessarily a problem with accounts that study certain social groups and measure inequalities between them, such as regional differences or whatever. But one possible problem here is that a lot of those differences can be correlated with other sort of demographic and um, sort of other historical happen chance almost differences between the groups that aren't really that important to the account. So if you think of the regionalization of, of the industrial distribution in, in the UK, lots of regional inequalities might in some ways be proxies for um, the regional distribution of industry and industrial opportunities, for instance. So trends in regional inequalities, it's interesting to report them, but they might just be picking up on some things in that respect. So that's one of the motivations. There's other reasons too, but one of the motivations for thinking about social distance alternatively as a thing to be studying, as, an, as a marker of social inequality. Because there's an argument about social connections, social associations between people um, that those that social connections are really fundamental to the organization of social inequality, how people place themselves in a structure, um, how people organize their lives and reproduce their circumstances from generation to generation, how they bring up their children and so forth. All of this hinges upon social relations with other people, interactions with other people. So the argument goes, if you study those patterns of social interaction, social relationships, you're actually going to pick up on structures of inequality that are the most are important structures of inequality, the organization of social inequality through social distance. So that's what, that's, that's, that's what motivates us partly to take this approach, to be studying patterns of connections between people. It's not, it's not a new innovation by any means. Lots of sociologists over the years have, have spent time studying social distance. And actually, my own research comes, it, um, develops from working with people involved in the, what was known as the Cambridge Group in Sociology. The, the Stuart Prandy and Blackburn in 1980 wrote Social Stratification and Occupations, or the Cambridge Scale Ranking of Occupations on the Basis of Social Distance Patterns. Um, social distance, as we're using it here, we're basically referring to differences between social categories, Group A and Group B, as measured according to the volumes of social interactions uh, between people in those categories. So the differences between different occupations on the basis of how frequently people have friends in different occupations, or the difference between educational levels, or the difference between newspaper readership uh, groups, um, measured according to how often people have these connections. There's been lots and lots of previous research on social distance in this framework in terms of occupations. There's the group originating with the, the Cambridge group and now the, the CAMSIS project, which I'm also part of. Other people as well studying occupational patterns of social distance. A few other studies in terms of other markers, eth ethnicity, um, uh, education, housing, and things like that have, have also been sometimes studied. Um, so a few reasons why it's, it's worthwhile thinking about social contacts. What, one point is that consequential le individual level outcomes are, of course, related to information about other people, people that you're connected to. So knowing about somebody's spouse's circumstance or, or their parent or, or their friends or whatever will help you to predict inequalities about individuals over and above data about the same people. So whether or not your spouse has a degree over and above, whether or not you yourself have, have a degree, that has some correlation with outcomes such as income, health, subjective well-being, voting preference, for example. But perhaps more interesting is that the social structure that you can detect by studying social distance is potentially revealing about the nature of social inequality itself. So this is the classic point with occupational data, Stuart Prandy and Blackburn in 1980 and, and others as well. Um, if you study occupations in terms of the profile of social connections between people in those occupations, you find structures of occupational inequality that are, that are revealing, that are slightly different to structures of an, in occupational inequality you might find in other dimensions. Classically, the social distance structure of in, occupational inequality gives a higher premium to, to, to the most advantaged professional jobs as compared to things like managerial jobs, which might be high income, but have less privileged profiles of social connections on the whole. So you might get slightly different structures of social, stru uh, social inequality 
from studying social dif difference. Um, there's also some um, pragmatic reasons as well to be paying attention uh, to social distance um, data and, and its analysis. Um, both the techniques of analysis that we can apply here and the data resources that we can bring to bear are uh, really expanded recently, many more opportunities in, in the relatively recent past. So we have examples for today of, of, of using different types of association models, um, social network analysis techniques, uh, uh, sort of random effects, multi-level models, and things like that, applied to data on social distance patterns. There's lots of different data resources that, that either have or can be used to, to reconstruct information about other people um, to feed into an analysis of social distance. So household surveys, a lot of the analysis we have is, is using household survey data where we're finding out data about other people in the household and using that as predictors of, of individual behavior. But then there's, the, you can use administrative data sets to find out about other people connected to, to people. Um, increasingly, social surveys are starting to, to again ask questions about other people that you know. This, in, in sociology, um, there were a few surveys in the 1970s that did a lot of this, but it, it went out of fashion somewhat in the 80s, 90s, um, last decade. But just recently, a number of further sociological surveys have started asking people questions about things like their friends, other people that they have associations with, um, which, which can be used here. So today, using data, mainly from the UK, mostly on e either reports about people's friends or alternatively the, the household sharers and mo actually most commonly the spouse is, is most of the analysis using pe information on a person's spouse as, as, as terminology. We've got a little bit of internationally comparative data as well and again those data resources are, are mainly household census surveys using um, uh, large-scale data with information about individuals but also about their spouse. Um, and in terms of methods of analysis um, it's fairly descriptive, the results I'll show today, thinking about ways of summarizing the structure of social connections between people, um, and then correlations between people on the basis of that structure and trends in those correlations over time. So typically we do, for example, correspondence analysis between, say, the husband's education and the wife's education. That gives us a structure. The first dimension of that correspondence analysis gives us a structure of, of inequality in terms of educational qualifications. And then we're looking at where people sit in that structure and the correlation on average across the population of husbands and wives defined through that structure and whether that correlation is changing through time. Um, I'll move on to the, directly to a few results then. First of all, thinking about leisure consumption, uh, lifestyle type data. Um, so typical depiction of the correspondence analysis technique that we use a lot of is, is in this image. So the first two dimensions of the correspondence analysis solution to the cross tabulation between the newspaper read by a husband and the newspaper read by, by the wife. There is actually plenty of difference there. It's not the case that Husbands and wives always read the same paper in, in survey data sets. There's enough difference in the data to, to pick up some interesting structure. And of course, this, the, the newspaper structure is quite recognizable. The first dimension is clearly to do with perhaps, well, I'd call it m maybe a social stratification, but it's perhaps education level as well. The second dimension may well be a political dimension, left-right dimension perhaps in, 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 in there. But first and foremost, looking at this first dimension, where people fit in the first dimension and whether that, that changes over time. Um, for example, a way of assessing if there might be some change over time, here we're using the British Household Panel Survey and we're just focusing on data collected in the 1990s on husband and wife newspaper readership. So we're asking people where people fit in the structure of social inequality as defined by newspaper readership. And, and if that correlates to other things and whether that correlation is, is changing over time. Um, so we've got an older and a younger cohort from the, this survey. And for example, if we were to look at home ownership sort of halfway down the table, for the older cohort, the correlation between position in the structure of social inequality um, and home ownership is, is stronger than for the younger cohort, for example. The trouble is obviously, in, in, in a data set like this, uh, what's essentially in the long run of history a, 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 a cross-sectional snapshot of uh, the BHPS is actually a longitudinal study, but we're focusing just on it within a few years. Obviously, we don't know if these differences between the older and the younger generation, whether they're aging effects or, or cohort effects, of course, at, the, at this stage. 
But the sorts of things we, we can do with this data that might answer the question, is Britain pulling apart, is look at the patterns of social connections between social categories and whether those patterns of connections might be changing over time. Um, so here we've got the patterns of connections between newspapers for the population as a whole, and we see what we've got is, is lines drawn when it's relatively more common for those readers of those newspapers to have social connections between them. Um, but if we split that up by age or, or, or birth cohort, um, we can see whether or not there's any suggestion of more ties or less ties with younger or more recent birth cohorts, for example. We, we suspect this data is, is, is pointing towards um, not Britain pulling apart, but Britain pulling together. And, and, and this example, and the reason for, for saying that is because what we see is for the, for the younger cohort, it's relatively more common for people to have connections between different newspapers, different newspaper categories, than for the older cohort. So the, the Britain pulling apart would be the situation where the more recent cohort are increasingly socially segregated, socially separated, not having connections between each other. Britain pulling together would be the other way around, and actually in terms of newspaper readership, at least for the BHPS, it's, it's Britain pulling together n rather than pulling apart. But still, no, n we haven't dealt with whether these are aging differences or, or cohort differences. Um, one, one of the things that we can start exploring with this sort of data is to think of the connections between social groups as, as social networks and to try and understand what sort of things might be driving the volume of social connections between these, the, these categories. So we're looking at the social networks analysis literature and, and the, the ways in which they've studied um, patterns of social links and, and the influences upon social links. So White has the influential concept of catnets, categories of social networks, so people move in different social categories which may or may not overlap and interact. So we're interested in seeing other, is there evidence of the existence of these catnets, categories of social networks, in, in terms of some, some of these patterns. So we think in terms of homogamy, husband-wife associations, and or homophily, uh, ego alter when the alter is a, a friend or a social contact, for instance. Um, the, 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 res the results I'll show just now, um, thinking of four different dimensions of social positions, four, four different social groups, one defined by education, one defined by newspaper readership, one defined by political views, and, and, and one defined by uh, religious category. So all of these things will influence um, social connections between people. You, it's likely to be the case that if you're in one category on any of these, it's more likely that your social connections are also in the same category and, and so forth. But we're interested in taking together how, how they influence each other, in, interact with each other, how they, um, which of these are most important in shaping social network connections and social network patterns. Um, to explore this, one way to approach it is to define pairs of situations that people can have according to their measured characteristics and, and assess how often different pairs of situations go together. So for example, here in this image I've got two um, people. One person has a university education, they're a Catholic, um, their, their political orientation is left and they read a broadsheet. The other person has a use, university education, they're a Muslim, their political orientation is center, and they read a tabloid, and, and these two have a social connection, they're husband and wife, or they, they live in the same household or something. So from that, there's a bunch of different two-way positions that are connected through the knowledge that these two people have a connection. So all we're, all we're saying is that we, we, we've, we've got some data about social connections between all these combinations of pairs of categories. And by arranging it in this way with pairs of categories, that's gonna allow us to test whether each one of these separate factors is influential in social connections, but also whether combinations of those factors, catnets, in terms of combinations of those factors, matter very much. So we've got, from, from, from survey data, we've got information on uh, the volumes of combinations of those things that are occurring. Um, now, um, one thing that you find one of the ways you can approach this in social network analysis is just look for whether or not a particular combination occurs much more often than would have been expected by if the combinations were distributed by chance. 
So you define some sort of threshold of the relative occurrence of that social connection, and you draw a line connecting the categories if it's above that threshold and, and not if not. Now, if you set that line quite high, um, what you find here with um, homogamy patterns is that one factor is much more influential than any of the others in the things we've measured. So it's religion mainly shapes the social connection patterns. So um, people are much more likely to be connected to each other if they're in the same religious group, regardless of newspaper readership and so forth, um, if we set the threshold quite high. However, if we lower the threshold, we get a lot more patterns of connections between different social groups that are plausible to analyze. So it, it, the, 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 the patterns of connections extend beyond religion with a less, um, with a less strict threshold. So, so, so we tend to focus on, on we, when, when we focus on um, the less strict threshold, we, we, we have the possibility of us evaluating the relative influence of these different factors more effectively. Um, so we've done this for both homogamy and homophily. Homogamy, husband, wife combinations, homophily, people living in the same household. I think, to speed up a little bit, I think I'll just focus on the results on homogamy um, in the next few slides and skip over homophily. But homogamy, um, we're asking to what extent the different factors um, excuse me, influence the volume of social connections um, measured in, 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 in social surveys. Um, religion, education, political views, newspaper type. Um, for the UK HLS, uh, a recent household survey, um, we see little difference between the younger and the older cohorts in the profile of those influence. Religion is the most important thing. Education is the next. So newspaper types the next most important. Education matters more, and 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 newspaper views. Uh, sorry, political views over and above that don't have a particularly strong uh, shaping factor. But for the UK LS, HLS, one suggestion is no great change between younger and older cohorts in those influences upon social connection patterns. We also did the same thing um, with the British Household Panel Survey using data more from the, well, this is wave one in 1991 of that survey, and just focusing on the, on the table on the left, the drivers of homogamy, slightly different patterns to the UK HLS and some suggestions of changes between the younger and older cohorts. Religion is less, much less of an important factor in the BHPS than the UK HLS, and that may well reflect the, the sampling design of the UK HLS incorporating a boost sample uh, of, of, of minorities. Um, but some degree of change, perhaps, over, over time. So political views matter relatively more to the younger than the older cohort in the BHPS, but religion matters uh, relatively more for the older cohort, for example. So the things that are driving volumes of social connections slightly higher um, for some categories than, than others. So that was uh, approaching understanding of the, the, the volume of connections between people, the social connections between people in terms of network analysis approaches, where you're interested in whether or not a connections occur a lot more often or not than some specified threshold. Another way to, to analyze the same data um, is some sort of log-linear modeling approach, where you, where you basically construct a table of the husband's characteristics, the wife's characteristics, or the ego and the alter characteristics, and you're trying to see what things improve the fit of the, of, of the log-linear models in terms of the different measured characteristics. So here, for example, just a subset of the data um, looking at newspaper readership and political views for husbands and wives, and we're going to fit terms that are basically corresponding to the different colors here. So we have a diagonal term which would, would be direct equivalence of the husbands and the wives characteristic, but the, the, the orange term would be saying um, similarity in newspaper readership but not in voting preference, and the blue term would be similarity in voting but, but not in newspaper readership, for example. Um, so we can fit these terms and use them as a way of, of evaluating what sort of things matter more or less to um, patterns of difference. So one of the log-linear uh, modeling analyses, this is for um, the whole of the UK HLS. Um, what all we're doing here is actually some fairly s simple examples of mo log-linear models. We're just comparing a model with one term versus the independence model in each case. But the, the, 
the factors that lead to the biggest improvement of fit from the independence model would be the ones we'd interpreted as the most important in structuring the, the patterns of, of social connections. So, for example, um, in the UK HLS, religion is the most important newspaper type and, and political views the next most important in, in these terms. And it's the, the things that matter most are the, the general structure of um, these factors rather than, um, rather than the two-way combination of them. So it's more important to know just newspaper readership or just a uh, religious group rather than the particular combination of newspaper and, uh, and, and religious group. So much more explanation from the single factor things rather than the two category uh, factors. Um, I'll skip over two slides. Um, but typically, we, we, can, we, we might ask from these sort of models, are there patterns of difference again over time? And, at, and again, at the moment, we're still a trouble with all of these analyses that I'm showing just at the moment is that the measures of them are only easily available to us at a recent, from recent social surveys. So we haven't got the long window of observations. We, we, we've got data from the 90s, 2000s, um, but not over a longer period of time. So the comparisons of social change is mainly about differences between older and younger people measured at the same point in time. But in the UK HLS, um, in this case, one conclusion, no strong evidence of pulling apart uh, because the things that drive social connections between people in terms of education, newspaper, re uh, readership, political views, and, and religious group are not really changing substantially um, from, from one generation uh, to the next. Um, we've got some other... Uh, we've, we've done the same thing with the BHPS as opposed to the UK HLS, so that's a, a sort of a, a difference of best part of 20 years in, in terms of the measurement. Uh, uh, m measurement of timing, um, but um, they're not in between the two surveys. We don't find huge differences in patterns of 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 of, of, of social associations, social distance patterns. So I'll I'll skip a, a couple of the results here. Actually, I was over ambitious in how many things I would want to talk about, but we've got some more some other things still. The main thing that this sort of analysis might contribute. So we're looking at things to do with people's lifestyle and circumstances, what sort of things shape social connection patterns between people as defined by these social groups, and whether there's any evidence of trend over time in it. Well, the social structure of inequality is an important dimension within the social interactions linked to leisure, consumption, behavior. And hitherto, we, ha we don't have particularly strong evidence of massive change over time um, for different measures of um, social circumstances, social groups. Combinations of identities, cat notes, are not particularly critical to understanding the, the empirical occurrence of these um, combinations of circumstances. Um, what matters, any one of these circumstances does have a significant influence upon uh, the, vo the, 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 the volumes of social connections between people, um, but those influences are broadly stable in the window of, 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 of observation that we've got. So first of all, in terms of summarizing on, on lifestyle patterns, well, hypothesis that there'd be some interest in patterns of social connections linked to lifestyle groups, that comes through, uh, but they don't particularly seem to give us evidence of massive social change or development in the UK. So I'll now turn to more conventional analysis of social trends in terms of socioeconomic rather than lifestyle patterns. So here we're thinking about what characterizes dimensions of social association in terms of socioeconomic and sociodemographic factors um, and whether those dimensions are changing. So here the, the focus is on occupation, educational categories, also ethnic and religious categories here. So again, we're going to use analysis of social connections to study the dimensions of social association, the dimensions of connections between people, and then ask whether there's any evidence of change over time. The difference here is focusing on these sorts of characteristics, we have a much lo longer window of measurement opportunity because these sorts of characteristics are recorded on pretty much any social survey um, going back to the 1970s when it's, for us it's relatively easy to get data on this. So, so now we have data from the 70s to the present day and we can analyze we, we can um, disentangle, as it were, aging and, and, and birth cohort effects, which is, would be an important need here. 
Um, well, of course, people are similar on all these characteristics. Um, people are much more likely to have social connections with other people at the same level. So here's just some data from the contemporary UK HLS to, to make that point. So they actually ask people about their friends and to what extent are their friends the same age, same, same income category, in this case, ethnicity, qualifications. All of these things, fairly um, strong patterns of social uh, association here. Um, and just by way of contrast, if we look at uh, birth cohort, homogamy percentage of um, people who are homogamous or the correlation essentially between ego and alter, husbands and wives, for the, the contemporary UK HLS data, we're not finding particularly strong patterns of change in terms of homogamy. If anything, um, for political and newspaper readership, perhaps declining associations, perhaps increasing associations with educational homogamy. So the image of Britain pulling apart would be all of these going up quite steeply uh, for more recent birth cohorts having stronger correlations between ego and alter, as it were. I'm not necessarily getting that. Okay, so consequential gaps between social groups, social groups in terms of occupations, education, ethnicity, um, and religious categories. And there has been quite a fair bit of previous research on social distance between some of these um, categories. What we tend to think hitherto, no major pe perturbations in the social structure of inequality associated with these different categories. So the same categories come out on top at earlier and later time periods. Um, and probably objectively measured correlations between husband, wife, or ego alter uh, on these characteristics, homogamy, homophily, usually thought to be largely stable across the 20th century and into the 21st century um, in the UK, possibly with educational homogamy most likely to be slightly increasing. A um, little bit back on, on, on the measures, so with occupations again, social interaction, scaling of occupations on the basis of social associations between the incumbents of occupations. First dimension of that scaling is, is social stratification, social inequality and in somehow. And this particular image is just showing that it doesn't really matter what social association we measure to calculate that scaling, whether we use connections between spouses, uh, co-resident males, parents and children, friends, whatever it is, tend to come out with pretty much the same scaling of occupational advantage. So the first dimension will be this stratification influence dimension. And this is a slightly larger version of an image I did briefly show before. The same analysis, the ranking of educational categories uh, through a correspondence analysis uh, of, of ego alter educational levels. And the ranking of educational categories on the basis of social interaction patterns, again, the first dimension is clearly something to do with social stratification or educational advantage, so social advantage in some way. Okay, thanks. Um, so we, we've got this structure of inequality that we can measure in this, in this respect. For ethnicity and religion group, we don't get the same easy story. If we do a social interaction analysis, social interaction distance analysis between ethnic categories or religious categories, we don't get clearly interpretable uh, dimensional structures. The first dimension of the solution is usually just one category versus all the others. The next dimension is, is one category versus all the others. We're not finding a, a, a smoothly recognizable depiction of social inequality in terms of social interaction differences uh, between ethnic and religious groups. Lamon did this in the 1970s and also came to similar conclusions. Um, uh, the difference with Laman's data on America was it was European groups within America, um, and the first dimension seemed to reflect assimilation with American life. So we, so we had the sort of the Protestants, the, the European Protestants at one end of the dimension, and, and for example, Asian categories at the other uh, end of the dimension. But isn't such a clear structure of social distance between ethnic categories uh, nor religious categories? So these images are just depicting the where the categories score in the first and the second dimension of social distance as, met, as analyzed by um, a, a correspondence analysis. So those dimensions, uh, the first dimension, for example, in terms of religion is, is essentially Muslims versus all other groups, for instance. So it's interesting to try these out, but it's not necessarily telling us something important about social inequality as measured in, in this respect. So how do we use that sort of, this sort of data, information on husband's wife, occupation, education, ethnicity, religious, religious group to assess um, social change. Well, we'd be asking about 
um, correlations between husbands and wives categories, e either the association statistic um, between the two categorical measures or an actual correlation based on ranking the categorical measures according to the first dimension of social distance. When we calculate those sorts of uh, statistics and look at how they're evolving through time or between cohorts, well, at the moment, using friendship data, mainly from the contemporary BHPS and some, uh, some social surveys from the 70s, well, we get a variety of results that don't have a strong trend. In the, in the next one, I've got, them, got these, the same results um, graphically. Um, we'd be asking if, if there's a really strong, compelling piece of evidence in these patterns to, 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 to reveal Britain pulling apart, increasing or decreasing over time. Probably at the moment, it's, it's inconclusive. Things are um, changing a bit, but not much either way. To, to, to assess these more comprehensively, it's better to use the long runs of, of cross-sectional surveys. General Household Survey pulled here from the 1970s to 2004. We've got the Labour Force Survey as well from a similar time period. Educational homogamy, for instance, with the General Household Survey, um, whether uh, the, the x-axis rather confusingly can be both the year of birth, but it can also be um, the inverse of age. Um, and, and time decade as well. But on all these different measures, and, and, and here we've got two different, the, the dark blue are when we've got education measured in four categories, and the purple is when we've got education measured in, in 14 categories. Um, the same sort of trend seeming to come through however we measure time and however we measure um, education. It becomes rather complicated because there's all different permutations of summary statistics about the husband-wife association that we could measure. So, th so, th so the top left is the Kramers V, just the, the, the association in the two-way table, but we can have the, the gap, the, the social distance between the top category and the bottom category, that's the, the second image. We can have the relative over-representation of the top category versus the bottom category. Um, we can have the correlation between husbands and wives in the first dimension. And we get these rather messy lines of trends. If we smooth them, we just, just apply lowest smoothing to, to the same lines Seemingly, an encouraging result is that most of the time it um, doesn't matter too much whether we have the more detailed or less detailed uh, educational categories and the different measures of time. The, tr the patterns of the trend line are kind of similar. And for educational homogamy, the, the trend line seems to be showing us uh, something of an increase through time. Um, oh, okay, Cup yeah, just almost there, sorry. <coughs> I'll, I'll, tr I'll try and wrap up. Sorry. Labour force survey. Trend, smooth lines uh, for, the, for, the, for the labor force survey, um, here using different eth ethnicity, education, occupation, religion. Well, um, the education lines perhaps showing some sort of trends. The other lines of association, nothing, nothing too clear in, 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 in the data. So not really <coughs> strong patterns of change over time in different ways. However, one interesting thing, um, when we... Um, We've got large microdata sets, pooled microdata. When we fit models to the microdata, looking at the difference between husbands and wives in the dimension scores, and we have simultaneously an age coefficient and a year of birth coefficient, so this is you know, disentangling aging and cohort effects. Well, the underlying year of birth uh, trends um, seem to be consistent and seem to tell us something interesting. So if you look at the second of those graphs, we've got education is the one that's going up, but occupation's going down ethnicity and religion uh, flatline. So Britain's pulling apart possibly in terms of education, not, no change in terms of ethnicity and religion, but maybe actually declining association uh, in terms of um, occupational advantage. Um, one or two other things that I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. summarize very quickly and, and then w w w one question might be, how well do the trends and statistics fit with a priori lines rather than letting, um, using a regression to calculate the best fitting line? So we could actually define what the line should be if Britain was pulling apart or really tearing apart in the, in the, in the quadratic sense. Um, so we could define these lines in advance and then ask to what extent does the data match those lines? Um, and we've done that for a variety of um, applications and I guess um, this is where um, we finish uh, for, for the moment, but when we do that, when, when we evaluate the different m things that we've measured, education, occupation, ethnicity, summarized in this table, 
um, and different summary statistics about the association, we do find some evidence of, 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 of social change in some cir circumstances. So often it's inconclusive. There's lots of no changes there. But in education especially, the association between ego alter education seems to be going up, up and down. But then counterbalancing that, um, the high-low distance in education, the, 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 the gap between advantaged and less advantaged categories is declining. So whether or not that's telling us about consequential social change is, 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 is less clear. So people are more likely to be associating with others of the same educational level, but the, but the social gap between the most and the less advantaged educational is, 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 is less uh, substantial. And, and different p patterns for occupation compared to education, so increasing homogamy, increasing social distance for education, not so clear in terms of occupation, not so clear in terms of ethnicity. Um, and I'll skip over, we've got some international comparisons too, say the same thing. So our conclusion at the moment is that there's lots of different social statistics that we can try and use to assess trends in social distance. But one thing that is clear is that there's not really strong and dramatic and consistent trend of increasing social inequality between people as measured through social distance. We've got change, but not social up upheaval. There, there definitely isn't evidence of Britain tearing apart. Some examples of social inequalities increasing, but some examples of them decreasing. And ongoing uh, methodological challenges with trying to summarize trends in all these different available social statistics. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there.